Good morning. Okay. All right. Let's uh, start. Uh, this thing is a bit loud. Okay. All right. Can you hear me in the back? Or it's... All right. Okay. Just uh, a reminder about the midterm on. Uh, Monday, tomorrow review session is 5 to 6.30 here. I'll have my officers as usual at Siebel uh, and then come here if somebody wants to come then. Um, okay, uh, let's uh, talk about spanning trees today. So everybody knows about what a spanning tree is, I assume, right? So we're working with undirected graphs today, okay? All graphs today will be undirected, not directed, okay? Uh, what is a spanning tree? It's a tree that contains all the vertices, right? And every connected undirected graph has a spanning tree. It can have many spanning trees. And uh, in the minimum spanning tree problem, we want to find the spanning tree with the lowest cost. So every edge has a cost or a weight or a length, whatever one wants to, is comfortable with. And we want to find among all the spanning trees of this graph, the one with the smallest total cost. Okay. And uh, you've seen probably this problem in 225, maybe, uh, not sure. Some of you may have seen it, remember it. And um, it's a very simple, uh, looking problem and it's an optimization problem and so in this graph this is uh, one spanning tree and this I think is the minimum spanning tree we'll see why that is right so why do people care about minimum spanning trees well you know spanning trees are important right because if I give an undirected graph and I say what is the smallest subgraph that actually preserves connectivity right that's the spanning tree right it's a certificate of uh, connectivity in an undirected graph. So it comes up, you know, if you want, to, if you search and see, you know, is a graph connected, what you will find is a spanning tree, if you do any kind of search. And the cost version of this has many applications for that same reason. Uh, it comes up in a ton of applications. More than, uh, not, more than the applications, uh, it's also, uh, I, mean, I mean, it has a lot of, uh, nice mathematical theory also around spanning trees. There are, there are many aspects of it which uh, I cannot go into right now. You will, if you do any kind of algorithms and graph structure, you'll encounter spanning trees and minimum spanning trees again and again, okay? Um, so, uh, uh, so there are, you've probably seen some greedy algorithms for minimum spanning tree computation, right, in the past, but, uh, you know, we'll see several more and uh, uh, greedy algorithms work well for minimum spanning tree computation and what does a greedy algorithm look like for this problem? You start with an empty tree, right? And you keep an empty set of edges, so nobody's connected and you keep adding edges in some greedy fashion till you get a spanning tree, right? So in which order should we add edges and why will it work? That's the thing that we'll discuss today, right? Why should even greedy algorithms work for this problem, right? Yeah. Uh, something is greedy if, again, you know, it's not easy to specify. It's a, an algorithm which makes decisions without looking back or without backtracking, right? Right, so it sort of makes a decision and that's it sticks with it. So it's not clear for many problems that it should work, right? It does work in some cases and it does work for spanning trees, right? So that's why it works is because it's a metroid and that's a deeper reason which I cannot discuss today, but okay. The simplest algorithm for uh, uh, minimum spanning trees or simplest, at least not necessarily in implementation wise, but conceptually the simplest algorithm is probably Kruskal's algorithm, right? It starts out by picking the edge with the lowest cost, right? 
and it says, okay, what's the lowest cost edge? Well, that's the lowest cost edge, right? And then it tries to add the next lowest cost edge, right? And okay, it can add that edge. And next lowest cost edge, and then what is the next lowest cost edge? That one. And ah, okay. Can it add this edge? No, because it creates a cycle, right? So we don't add that edge. Right? So we keep going, right? And we try that, and that's that's the algorithm, right? Okay. Very simple, right? Uh, it works. Okay. We have to figure out why it works. Yeah. No, no, not, not before. When will I, I want to find a spanning tree. I try to add an edge. Why can I not add it in a, a, a edge? If I want to keep the spanning tree property, I cannot add an edge because the greedy algorithm, it has already taken all the previous edges. If it adds this edge, it will create a cycle. So it cannot be added. So we don't add it. Right? Yeah. Ah, how do you check whether it is a cycle? Well, you know, you, you have to look at uh, what you've already added and see if they are in the same connected component. Right? That's one, one not very efficient way of doing it. We'll see how to do it faster. Okay? But I'm not worried about implementation at this point. I mean, it is easy to see that you can implement it in polynomial time. Right? You, you, you all have a set of edges and you are adding a new edge. Are they in the same component? Yes, if they are, then there is a cycle. Otherwise, they are not. Well, how fast you can implement it, that's a different issue. Okay, Prim's algorithm is a different greedy algorithm where you create a tree which expands from a given node. You can pick an arbitrary node and you grow the tree in a greedy fashion till you reach a spanning tree, right? In, in uh, Kruskal's algorithm, you're just adding edges one by one. You sort the edges and you add one by one till you get a spanning tree, right? In Prim's algorithm, you start with any node. For simplicity, we'll start with one, and you're always going to maintain a tree that contains one, and you grow the tree to include one more node, one more node, till you reach everybody. Okay? All right, what, how can I grow my tree in a greedy fashion? What edge should I add to reach one more node? It's like the basic search, right? We are doing a basic search from one, except that because we want to minimize the cost of the tree we are finding, we will grow the tree in a greedy fashion. Okay, what is the edge I should add to my current tree? The cheapest edge that leaves the tree to somebody who is not in the tree. Yeah? Okay? So the current tree is 1. What is the cheapest edge leaving this set 1? That's 1, right? So now my tree is 1 and 7. What is the cheapest edge leaving this tree? Four, right? Okay. And what is the cheapest edge leaving this tree to outside? Nine. Okay. Now three and seventeen and nine. Okay. Sorry. But it's but it's already in the tree, no? I mean, if I add that, why would I grow the tree? Okay, so that's Prim's algorithm. Okay, that also is giving the MST. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, here is a, another funky algorithm, which is uh, called reverse delete algorithm. Okay, this is not a greedy algorithm. In, it's a reverse greedy algorithm in a different sense, right? You start out with every everybody in the graph, right? But you want a tree. If it's a tree, you, you, you know, if your graph is a tree, what are you going to do? You have to have everything in there, in there right? But if it's not a tree, you want to remove edges till you get, you only get stuck with the tree. What edge should be removed? You say, ah, okay, you know, is there, a, let's look at the highest weight edge. If I can remove it and keep the graph connected, I will remove it. Okay, this is the opposite, I mean, the sort of the inverse of Kruskal's algorithm, right? You sort the edges in decreasing order, right? And then you try to remove edges as long as you can remove them without disconnecting the graph. Is the algorithm clear? I'm not going to simulate it because it's going to be a bit of a mess. Yeah? It's just a very simple algorithm. It also works. Okay. Okay, that's nice. Well, we have three algorithms now and they all work. Right? Okay. 
and this is another algorithm this is perhaps the first uh, algorithm it's called uh, borukas algorithm and uh, so what does this do it's a little bit more complicated it says you know it's not complicated to implement actually it's very easy to implement um so it says ah okay look at the beginning everybody is there in their own connected component right there are no edges okay so for every co component you pick the cheapest edge leaving that component okay every component picks independently the cheapest edge leaving that component okay it says look you know i have to connect myself and this is the cheapest edge i better pick that edge because that will connect me to somebody else right so it could be that you know two components pick the same edge because it's the cheapest edge for both of them right and every all the edges from all those components are added so let me and then we have new connected components and we repeat the process till the whole graph is connected so here i'll i'll, I'll do that uh, with uh, um with an example let's see so initially what are the components everybody is in their own component right yeah no I think I've said it many times. No, I, I did last time I posted on the chat, right? You know, it's not on the homework. Logical, right? It's not on the exam. Okay. Uh, so every co component picks the cheapest edge, leaving it. What is the cheapest edge leaving this component? One. Okay. So I won't add that edge. So I will add that edge. happen to this ah. okay so we pick this edge Sure, what's going on with this today? Okay, let's see. Okay. Okay, we may have to. All right. It's okay. We, you see what edge we'll add. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay. So each component picks uh, an edge which is cheapest out of it, and so this guy will pick one. What about this component? It's the same edge, right? Because it's the cheapest, so both will pick one. So we'll add one from both sides in some sense. What about this guy? It'll pick four, right? So we'll add four as well. What about this guy? Three, and this guy will also pick three, right? And what about this guy? Seventeen, right? And this guy? Twenty-three, yeah. And so, what happens when we add this edge, this edge, this edge, and this edge? So we we'll, we connect everybody, right? Okay. In this case, we are done with one shot, right? Because what happens after that? We get one connected component. In general, we may actually get many connected components, right? Because we may not connect. And then we do it again till. We we shrink those components. We get new connected components. We do it again, okay. And we do it again till we connect everybody. That's Baruch's algorithm, okay. Is that okay? The algorithm is okay. Yeah. 
one more algorithm that also works okay there are many different I, I showed you basically four different algorithms all right for MST and they all I claim they all work right clearly we don't want to figure out why they're all working separately if you can we can want to find out why are they all working is there some generic principle that makes them work and we'll see some very simple property which makes all these MST algorithms work so that we can think of the correctness in a unified fashion rather than try to think about all of them uh, differently right okay so we're going to make one technical assumption which will make our life easy and we'll get rid of the technical assumption once we are done we'll assume that all the edge costs are distinct that means that no two edges have the same cost okay if they are you know we'll perturb them a little bit or think of them in some other way right so the edge costs are distinct will help us understand the proof much more easily than if they were different I mean, if they had some uh, ties okay all right okay edge costs are uh, equal I mean are not equal right are distinct okay a very important concept in graphs which uh, you know is particularly relevant here is notion of a, a cut uh, what is a cut you know it's just a partition of the graphs into two pieces or two sets of vertices okay s and v minus s okay so it's called a cut because it separates it right okay so if you look at a, a partition of the graph into in terms of the vertex set into s and v minus s we can see that some edges cross this cut right yeah they go across this cut with one endpoint on this side and one endpoint on the other side right okay and uh, so we, we think of this as edges as crossing the cut so we'll do some we'll we'll look at some definitions which is which is, makes our life easy so given a graph with non negative edge weights or in general edge weights an edge is called a safe edge if there is some cut right such that edge is crossing that cut and it is the cheapest edge crossing that cut okay so okay so let's let me i will see an example okay that's the definition right an edge is called safe if there is some cut that this edge crosses and among all the edges crossing the cut this one is the cheapest okay and similarly we can define a slightly i mean very related notion an edge being unsafe or useless or in some other way right if there is a cycle in the graph that contains this edge and this is the heaviest edge in that cycle okay and i'll give you an example right okay and then we'll see later on that for every graph for if the edge weights are distinct every edge is either safe or unsafe it partitions the graph into safe and unsafe but we'll see that later so okay here is a, a graph and uh, there are some edges crossing this cut which one is a safe edge the one with the lowest weight right three and if the edge weights are distinct there will be only one edge per cut which is safe right yeah because otherwise there are no ties right that's the assumption okay so that's the safe edge okay so one important thing to notice is that an edge can be safe for many cuts yeah right you know because see look at the cheapest weight edge right for every cut that this edge crosses this will be the safe edge right because it's the lowest weight edge right okay is that clear that for every cut there is a safe edge but an edge can be safe for many cuts yeah see if i take the cut which contains just this vertex and everybody else it might still be a safe edge because it's the lowest weight edge yeah no no not really no we're not making any assumption about being connected or not it's just a partition of the world okay all right uh okay so look at this cycle what is the unsafe edge on this cycle the heaviest weight edge unsafe edge is the heaviest weight edge on a cycle okay so no not that this 15 i guess yeah all right this is the most expensive edge yeah okay okay let's see in this graph which edges are safe and which edges are unsafe
36 is unsafe because it's the cheap, the heaviest edge in this cycle, right? Okay, what about one? Is it safe or unsafe? It's safe because if you look at the cut, this vertex and the rest, that's cheapest edge, right? Okay, is four safe? Because of the cut two and everybody else, this is the cheapest edge. Right? In general, for every vertex, the cheapest edge leaving that vertex will be safe, right? Yeah. Okay, but why is uh, is is uh, is nine safe? I claim it is safe because you can look at this cut. Okay, can you see that? <laughs> And that is okay. If I can draw it again, I will draw it. Not why, why should it magically work now, right? <laughs> I don't understand the mechanism of this. Anybody who is a surface expert? Okay, let me do one thing. Uh, right. Try again. This reboot philosophy of Windows is kind of annoying, but uh, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. No, something else in the okay, I'll give up. Um, all right, so uh, my claim is that all these red edges are safe, okay? Well, you, could, you already saw why, you know, one is safe, four is safe. Why is 23 safe? Well, it's the cheapest edge around six, right? Okay, but the more interesting case is nine because the reason why nine is safe is because of this cut, right? Yeah? If you look at one, three, six, seven, eight, two, this set of vertices, nine is the cheapest edge leaving that cut, yeah? Okay? Okay. Do you see something interesting happening here? What happened? That is the main one Spanish. Something, right? You know. Okay. Yeah. 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 There must exist a cut for which it's the smallest edge crossing that cut. No, cuts. Unsafeness is defined with respect to cycles, not cuts. Right? It's a little misleading, maybe the name terminology, but it will see that, uh, yeah. So, it, it, I mean, first of all, it is not clear that an edge cannot be safe and unsafe, right? Okay, but it's easy to argue that it cannot be. Okay, why is that? Can an edge be both unsafe and safe? Why not, right? Okay, so here is the reason why it cannot be uh, unsafe and safe. How can an edge like this be safe? Sorry? Yeah, so why cannot, I claim that if I have a cycle and this is the most expensive edge in that cycle, it cannot be safe. Yeah, so any cut that crosses, that this edge crosses, there will be one of these edges which will also cross that cut, right? Okay, but they're all cheaper than this guy, so this cannot be safe for that cut. Okay, is that clear? We'll use that proof later on, yeah? So a unsafe edge cannot be safe, right? And the other way also you can prove, right? So if the edges, edge weights are distinct, every edge is either safe or unsafe. You can prove that, okay? All right, okay. 
but that don't worry about that right now okay we'll prove it yeah okay you see that you know so this is uh, this is basically the the theorem we are going towards that basically the edge weights are distinct then the mst is nothing but all the safe edges and it's unique there is not no choice in the matter there is only one spanning tree if the edge weights are distinct there is no choice okay so what does it mean that every minimum spanning tree algorithm is figuring out all the safe edges that's why they're all correct right so that's a structural property of minimum spanning trees if the edge weights are distinct that there's only one unique spanning tree and all of them have to find it okay so that's why we're going to prove that by saying that if e is a safe edge then and all the edge weights are distinct every minimum spanning tree must contain that edge okay is the lemma clear the statement what we're trying to say that if e is a safe edge then every minimum spanning tree must contain that edge this is true only if the edge weights are distinct i, I won't repeat it again because otherwise it's not true okay all right okay so how do we prove this okay so uh, the way we prove it before i put the text on is that if e is a safe edge and there is no there is a minimum spanning tree which does not contain e what we will do is we'll add e to that tree what happens if i add an edge to a tree which is not in the tree it creates a unique cycle right yeah all right and then i'm going to claim that there is some edge on the cycle that i can remove what happens if i remove an edge on that cycle other than e will i get another spanning tree yeah because i i added an edge and i created a cycle right but i can remove any edge on the cycle without disconnecting the graph right okay so if i can find an edge on that path which is of lower cost so is a higher cost than the edge i added then it's clearly not a minimum spanning tree right because i added this edge i removed one edge and my cost will only go down if i'm cheaper if i can prove to you that you know that oh look there will always be a more expensive edge on that cycle if e is a safe edge then that cannot be a minimum spanning tree which would be a contradiction right so that i'm trying to prove that you know if e is a safe edge and it's not in your minimum spanning tree then that must not have been a minimum spanning tree okay is that proof idea clear okay okay so suppose for contradiction e is not in some minimum spanning tree of the graph t right so what does it mean it is safe e is safe means that there is some cut for which e is the smallest weight edge crossing that cut right yeah okay since t is connected there must be some edge f with one end point in s and other end point in v minus s right t also has to cross that cut right yeah because t is connecting everybody right you know if i have s and v minus s there must be some edge of t crossing that cut right yeah is it okay then i can one simple proof might be i can remove that edge and add e and i'll get a new spanning tree which is of lower cost because e is the lowest weight edge on that crossing that cut but you are a little bit careful and 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 i'll say why why that is a, a little dangerous right okay okay suppose i claim look at this edge f right uh which is of length 9 uh, right suppose you f is not in your mst okay i claim that the red edges are an mst is the red edges an mst not really because I, f is not there and this edge is there right you know I, that shouldn't be there actually right so how do we get a contradiction by saying ah look why did you not include e uh, this, this edge f well you add this and you say wait why is this a, a safe edge it is because there is a cut such that this is the lowest weight edge crossing that cut right okay so you say ah wait if this is the lowest weight edge crossing the cut and the spanning tree has to cross this cut no because it's connecting okay if you try to remove that edge and add this edge will you get a new spanning tree no you won't get a new spanning tree right okay 
see if you add this edge and remove that edge you won't get a new spanning tree you won't get, you won't get a contradiction right which edge should you remove and add this edge this guy right because if you remove this guy and add this you'll get a new spanning tree and it's lower cost and then you'll get a contradiction right okay so when the remember this is the cut which certifies that this edge is safe right there are more than one edge of the spanning tree which are crossing this cut you can't pick arbitrarily anything and remove it and claim that you can add this and get a new spanning tree okay you should remove this guy and who is this guy okay now we have to prove something stronger the correct proof is that if if you add this safe edge you get a cycle in the tree okay i claim there is some edge in that cycle which must cross the cut which certifies that this guy is safe right okay so why did i pick okay so here is the thing so you did not include this edge which is safe why is it safe because there is a cut which says that this is the cheapest edge crossing that cut then i say okay look let's add this edge to the spanning tree what do you get you get a cycle right what is the cycle this triangle right i claim there is some edge in that cycle which crosses that cut why is that it's very simple right you know you start walking from this end point to that end point along that cycle right at some point you have to go from this side to the other side right okay so and and you are walking along that path from this guy to that guy in the tree so there is an edge on the path from this end point to that end point which is also crossing the cut right okay and because this guy is a safe edge that edge's weight must be more than this guy say right so i'll remove that and add this i'll get a cheaper tree but it's also going to be a spanning tree why because i only removed an edge which is on the cycle right so i will maintain connectivity okay so it's a, it's an in, i mean all i'm trying to say is that you have to be a little bit careful about the proof and not simply say oh i'll remove any edge which crosses this cut you cannot remove this edge you have to remove this edge okay yeah make sense okay so every safe edge must be in a minimum spanning tree if it is not there i can reduce the cost of the spanning tree okay all right so that's good so all the safe edges are in every spanning tree okay uh okay uh okay that's that's just the proof in more detail okay the second yeah no 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 not largest no i didn't do that okay okay let's go with the proof okay it's it, it, okay it may not be the largest weight in the cycle there must exist some edge in the cycle which crosses the cut okay not necessarily largest weight i claim that somebody on this path must cross the cut and all i mean and because that edge must be cheap more expensive than this because it's crossing the cut i'm not using cycle property here i'm using the cut property yeah because it is safe so that's it okay okay the second thing we will claim is that all the safe edges must form a connected graph okay if i take all the safe edges they must form a connected graph if you get this property then what are we going to claim then the safe every safe edge must be in we saw that every safe edge must be in every minimum spanning tree and they connect the graph so they must form the minimum spanning tree right yeah is that clear okay so why should every Uh, if i just take the safe edges why should they connect the graph well suppose it is not connected what does it mean i have multiple connected components right then look at any connected component look at the cheapest edge that is crossing it right there must be an edge crossing it because the graph itself is connected then one of them must be safe right suppose i take a bunch of edges and they don't connect the graph what does it mean i have a bunch of connected components take any connected component it doesn't include everybody and look at all the edges leaving that connected component 
pick the cheapest edge. That must be a safe edge, right? Yeah? You should include it because I'm including all the safe edges. So that cannot be, right, that you, know, you did not connect the graph because for every connected component, there is at least one safe edge leaving that connected component. So I cannot not, I cannot, uh, if I take all the safe edges, I cannot have a disconnected graph. Yeah? Okay? So with these two properties, what do we get? That every safe edge must be in every span, minimum spanning tree, right? And the safe edges form a, at least a spanning tree. So from this, we will get the property that safe edges are precisely the minimum spanning tree of the graph, and it's unique. Right? There's no choice, right? All the safe edges must be in the spanning tree and they form a spanning tree. Okay? So where did we use the fact that, uh, that uh, the wage weights are distinct? Where did we use the fact that the wage weights are distinct? In a couple of places, right? When we said that when I add a safe edge, the one I kick out must have a more expensive than the edge I added, right? If the edge weights are not distinct, I cannot claim that that guy will be strictly more expensive than the safe edge. Okay? So why, why should it be? You know, I can't claim that I'll get a contradiction because if, if this guy's weight is also nine, can I claim that I can kick that guy out, add this and get a cheaper tree? I can't claim that, right? I'm using the fact that edge weights are distinct to claim that this is the unique smallest weight edge crossing this cut. So the other guy must be strictly more expensive. Okay, that's what I'm using the. Okay, so this property is not true as you can, obviously, right? You know, if the edge weights are not distinct, there cannot be unique spanning tree. Take a, edge, a graph with only edge weights one, like a standard graph with no weights. There could be many spanning trees, right? It's not unique, right? It's unique only if the edge weights are, uh, I mean, not only if, uh, uh, if the edge weights are distinct, then it's, there's a unique MST. Uh, the other direction can be true even if the edge weights are not distinct. So what does it tell us? That every minimum spanning tree must be identifying the safe edges, right? Because we know, I mean, there is only one spanning tree. So it, there must be identifying this. Now let's go back and argue why all of these algorithms are correct by noticing that they're just finding the safe edges. If you can argue that all these algorithms are basically adding the safe edges, then we'll be happy, right? We know what the minimum spanning tree is. So let's do that. Okay. Uh, Prim's algorithm. Why is Prim's algorithm correct? Okay. We want to claim that it's only adding safe edges. If you can prove that, then we are done, right? Because we know the minimum spanning tree is precisely the set of safe edges. Why is Prim's algorithm adding only safe edges? Okay, let's go back to the Prim's algorithm, if you remember. What does Prim's algorithm do? It starts with a node, arbitrary node, and what does it grows the tree, right? So what is it adding at each step? It's adding the safe edge, getting out of the connected component it currently has, no? Yeah, because it's finding the cheapest edge going out of the current component and adding it, right? That must be a safe edge, right? Because by definition, there's the cheapest edge going out of this component, right? That's a cut. So it's only adding safe edges at each step, right? So it must be correct. Yeah? Assuming edge weights are unique, again, I mean, distinct again. Yeah? Agreed? Yeah? Okay. So why is Kruskal's algorithm correct? What is it doing at each step? It's a little bit more tricky, right? Why is Kraskal's algorithm correct? Okay, in the beginning, why is it correct, right? So first stage, why is it correct? The cheapest one is safe, right? There's no big problem with that, right? Yeah. Okay, but what is about the second one, right? Sorry? Oh, next cheapest one, but why is it safe? Yeah, there are no cycles, yeah. 
It's not unsafe. Yeah, okay. One way of seeing it is it's not unsafe, right? Okay, but that requires you to argue that the, 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 every edge which is not safe is unsafe, right? Okay. Okay, so Kraska's algorithm requires a little bit more work to see that you're only adding safe edges, right? Yeah? Okay. A little bit more work, right? Even though it seems more natural algorithm, you have to see a little bit more of why it's uh, adding only safe edges, right? Another way of seeing it is, when I add an edge in Kraskal's algorithm, what am I doing? I'm connecting two connected components, right? Which have no edge between them, right? Now look at the, look at either component, doesn't matter. I claim that this edge is the cheapest edge leaving that component. Why? Yeah, if there is another cheaper edge leaving this component, it would have come in the sorted order before the edge I'm adding now, right? And I had not considered it earlier because if I had considered it earlier, I would add it because that would not create a cycle, right? So that's another way of seeing it, yeah? Okay? Questions that you can convince yourself that Kraskal's algorithm is only adding safe edges, right? So that's the reason Kraskal's algorithm is correct. Why is, uh, you know, that for the same reason, uh, you can also argue that, uh, uh, Baruch's algorithm is also correct. What is it doing at each step? It has connected components and we are picking the cheapest edge leaving each connected component, right? They're all safe. Yeah? So it's correct. Yeah? So see, it's so nice to see that that they're all of them are correct for the same reason, that they're only adding safe edges, right? Okay? Okay. And the reverse delete also, you can argue that it's only deleting unsafe edges and... and Okay, good. So now that we understand why all these MST algorithms are correct, we need to argue why, uh, I mean, how do you argue when there are, uh, the graph can have, uh, 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 ties as well, right? You know, why did I make this assumption? How can I get rid of it? Uh, okay. So how can we get rid of this assumption that I made uh, that, um, Edge weights are distinct, right? What's the heuristic argument? Well, you put up the edge weights a little bit, right? Okay, add some random noise, okay? You can do that, no? If I add a random noise, you know, there is a, the probability that I'll make them, if I add tiny noise to everybody, you know, think, you know, all the edge weights are between one and some big number, and I add a tiny noise with some uh, small noise, then they'll all have slightly different edge weights, right? That's not a, I mean, we are in a theory class, right? But just, you know, intuition is also important, right? How can you formalize this, right? This is an important technical argument that is useful in many contexts, right? Whenever you feel like the proof becomes simple, if I make the assumption that the edge weights are distinct, how can I kind of pretend that they're actually really distinct? Not only pretend for the sake of the proof, but also from an implementation point of view, sometimes it's important or useful to have this property, right? So that you create a unique solution rather than, uh, you know, different runs of the algorithm create different spanning trees and then it, there's some non-determinism and stuff. So there is a very simple uh, way to do this. And it's a trick that is useful uh, in general, right? So what you do is that you want to make sure that the edge weights are actually that if I compare two edges, so what does it mean that the edge weights are distinct, right? We don't want ties in sorting, right? Okay. So how can we prevent that? We can prevent having ties in sorting by imposing an order on the edges by adding an extra parameter. So think of it like this. So we we have a given edge order, right? And all the edges are numbered 1 to M. Give some order, doesn't matter. Fix the order, right? It's in the order that the graph is represented. So E1, E2, E M, right? So then you say that if two edges have the same weight, the guy with the earlier index is actually cheaper than the next guy, right? So what are, what are we really doing? We are making the edge have two parameters, the weight, and the index of it, right? And we are putting an order on the edges, a strict order on the edges by saying, 
if the weight is smaller, strictly smaller than the other guy's weight, then it is smaller. If there are ties, then I will prefer the guy with the smaller index. Right? Does that make sense? So we are using a, the indexing of the edges to break ties. Okay? And that will make sure that this proof will go through, then we have a full order and the edge weights will be distinct and not only in terms of the proof, but on the implementation, we, this is a useful trick. Okay? Make sense? Yeah? Okay. Okay, this is a thing to remember. Okay. Uh, what about uh, edge weights being positive or negative? Okay, let me not put the thing, uh, let, let me uh, ask you, right? If I want to, does the algorithm work if some of the edge weights are negative? Wait, did I, did I use anywhere that the edge weights are uh, positive? Or did I, did I actually use anywhere? Uh, okay, yeah. Based on the, uh, oh, because uh, the cost is the same, right? The cost is based only on the, on the weights and not on the second parameter, right? Oh, so you're, you're asking, uh, yeah. Oh, because, you know, once I replace that, right, you know, the cost of any solution is the same as the cost in the, according to the original uh, weights, right? I didn't, okay, I didn't add anything. I'm only using it as a, to compare two guys with the same weight. Okay, another way of, I mean, maybe you, you want to, another way of doing it is you go back to the noise argument, okay, and think of this the second parameter as adding a, a tiny weight which doesn't uh, affect the, it is so small compared to the minimum edge weight. And then you can do all the formal calculations. It will work out. Yeah. This is, this is, uh, we're just breaking ties here. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I see that, you know, so, uh, there's still a little bit of doubt in your mind, right? Yeah. I can convince you, but not quickly. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So, okay. So, uh, what if I want to find a maximum weight spanning tree, not minimum weight spanning tree? Sorry? You said negate the edges. Okay, why did it, why does it work? I mean, we said it won't work in Dijkstra's algorithm. If you negate all the edge weights, you can uh, create various funky things. Why does it work here? If you believe it works. Well, you can say, oh, look, you know, in the proof, you did not use anywhere that the edge weights are positive, so it must work. That's a good answer. But then we have to go back and say, okay, the, why did the proof not you, you rely on the fact that all the edge weights are, right? Is there some nice property that is true of spanning trees that is not true of shortest paths? Well, that's one, not quite. There is more fundamental reason. Not quite, not quite. Why did it not work in Dijkstra's algorithm or, or in shortest paths? Why is it the case that, you know, somebody said the idea, oh, if the edge lengths are negative, let's add a big number and make them positive. Yeah? Why did it not work then? Ah, different number of edges on the path, right? But what happens with spanning trees? I can do the same trick, right? If edge lengths are negative, I can add a big number and make them all positive, right? I claim it will work now. Why? I mean, you're going back to the proof, but I want a more uh, sort of non, you didn't even know that how the algorithms worked. Okay. Yeah. 
Exactly. Every minimum spanning tree has exactly, every spanning tree has exactly the same number of edges, right? So adding a big number to all the edges is a, a same shift for every spanning tree. Okay? You add a big number, all the spanning trees are affected by the same amount, right? N minus 1 times the shift, whatever we added. Well, that's not true of shortest paths, right? Some paths may have 10 edges and some paths may have 200 edges. If you add a big number, the edges which have two, the paths which have 200 edges are affected more by than the paths which are, have only 10 edges, right? But spanning trees all have the same number of edges. So it's okay to add a big number and make them all positive and then solve the minimum cost. Okay? So that's the fundamental property. Yeah. No, you can. I'm saying that even if you, suppose, you know, here is a simple thing, right? For some reason, you know, somebody has implemented minimum spanning trees and they have an assertion which says that if the edge length is negative, crack. I mean, I, it doesn't work. For some reason, they did it. You want to use it as a black box. What are you going to do? You have two options. You can re-implement the minimum spanning tree algorithm or you can add a big number to make sure everything is positive and use the same code and then recover the spanning tree, right? So it's important to know, it's not, uh, not just knowing the proof, but you can, you can just understand it this way, right? All right, is it clear? Yeah. Oh, directed trees are, uh, uh, okay. So a yeah, good question, you know, why do we talk, I mean, what is the notion of a directed tree? They're called arborescences, okay? A, if you have a directed graph and you, you, you look at a vertex and you look at, you know, if you do a search from a vertex, and suppose it can reach everybody. What does the search output at the end of the algorithm? It outputs a search tree, right? But that search tree is directed, right? Yeah, it was a directed graph. So that directed out tree is called an arborescence. Okay, it's a, now I can, you can ask the problem, can we find the minimum cost arborescence? And you can find it, but it's a little bit more tricky algorithm. Okay, it's not as simple as minimum spanning trees. If you're interested, you can read about it. It's, it's, a, it's a very, Pretty algorithm requires uh, thinking a little differently. It's a little bit more involved. Uh, it's there in Kleinberg Tardos book if you want to find the, how to find the minimum cost arborescence at a, in a directed graph. Okay. You can find that but not using this algorithm. Okay. And another reason why spanning trees have all these nice properties is because, as I said, they are connected to what are called matroids. Okay. If you are interested, you can read about matroids. They're very pretty. Uh, um, okay, uh, now, okay, we know all these simple algorithms work to find a minimum spanning tree. Let's wor worry a little bit about how fast can we implement these algorithms and what running times can we get. Okay, is that okay? Okay, how fast can we implement? Let's just look at the, in some sense, the simplest algorithm to implement, which is Prim's algorithm. Okay, let's first start with Prim's algorithm. So what does Prim's algorithm do? Oh, no, not that actually. Uh, let's do Baruka's algorithm is actually the simplest algorithm, right? Uh, not simplest in, in, in some sense. Uh, so what is Baruka's algorithm? Start with everybody in their own connected components. Each connected component pick the shortest one, right? And then what do you get? You get a set of edges. So then you recompute the connected components and then find the cheapest edge out of each connected component, add them, do it again, right? So how long does it take to find the cheapest edge out of each connected component? So at each step, what do I have? I have a collection of edges which form a forest, right? What am I trying to find? For every component, I want to find the cheapest edge leaving it in the original graph. How fast can I do that? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, after the first iteration, I get, uh, I get, uh, I add some edges, right? And then I get connected components because I already added those edges. And in the next iteration, you have to find for every connected component, the cheapest edge leaving it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you implement it a little carefully, in O of M time, you will find those, all those edges I claimed. 
Is that okay? It's not completely obvious, but if you're, if you do some basic implementation a little bit carefully, I can claim that finding, finding all those cheaper stages can be done in O of M time. Okay? Yeah? All right? You should figure it out if it is not completely clear, right? Okay. So, but then, how many times are we going to do it? Until we connect everything, right? How long, how many iterations will that take? Sorry? Why log n? Yeah, I claim that's correct. Every iteration, the number of connected components goes down by at least half. Why? Because I'm adding one edge from each connected component, right? So I'm going to connect with somebody at least, right? Okay, so the number of connected components after one iteration drops by at least half. It can, it can finish in one iteration action, right? Like that example, if we add all of that and we are done in one iteration, right? But in the worst case, what is the worst case? Two guys join, two guys join, two guys join, two guys join, right? And so initially we had all these connected components and they join just like a matching, right? They, they pair up, right? That's the worst case, right? That means that in that case, they only go down by half. The number of connected components goes down by half. So the, the number of iterations of this algorithm is only log n. And each iteration takes m time, right? So the running time of this algorithm is o of, uh, o of m log n, okay? It's a very simple algorithm. No data structures, nothing, right? The only thing you need to do is find the cheapest edge leading these connected components. Okay, one of the earliest algorithms, very simple, M log n, no fancy data structure. Okay? All right? Okay, that is Varu Prasad. Now look at Prim's algorithm. What does Prim's algorithm do? You start with that empty tree, I mean, it's tree containing one node, and you have to, what do you need to do? You have to find the cheapest edge leaving it, right? Okay? Oh, how do you find the cheapest edge leaving it? Okay. Sorry? Okay. Oh, you're looking at all the edges and edges again and again? That seems like a lot of work, no? Yeah, you can sort it one time, but uh, that's for Kraskal's algorithm, right? But remember Prim's algorithm. Prim's algorithm is a little different, no? I mean, I mean, not a little different than Kraskal's algorithm. You can't sort all the edges and find them uh, in, in one shot, right? You know. So people, uh, okay, how, how does it work, right? You start with uh, one. How do you find the cheapest edge leaving this one? All three edges. Okay, okay, that, how long does it take? It, it's, it's uh, out degree, right? Okay. Uh, and then, but when you add this edge, how do you find uh, the next stage in leaving this guy? So, I mean, now, now the, what are new edges that are potentially possible? Oh, this one, should we consider this one, this one, this one, this one, right? So, how will we implement this efficiently? No, 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 but oh, okay, but it's okay, you know, after you add seven, if you, you, you can do the following, right? You look at the current component, examine all the edges again and find the cheapest edge. But that's pretty slow, no? How long does it take? N iterations, a lot of edges we're scanning again and again, okay? How can we use data structures to speed this up? Sorry? Priority queue on what? Ah, okay. He, okay, here is what he's saying. He's saying, you know, store the edges in a priority queue that are outgoing from the current component. Okay, okay, fine. That will allow you to pick the cheapest edge out of that, right? But how will you update it? What happens when you add a new node? Uh, 
well, okay, you know, you're storing edges in the priority queue, right? Okay, so let's look, we added this, we added this. What is the next guy we'll add? We'll add this guy, right? But what happens to this edge 20 then? You have to remove it from the priority queue, right? But how will you check whether that 20 should be removed or not? You can do that by how? Ah, yeah. So his idea is correct, right? So what happens is that, you know, you maintain all the edges that are leaving the current component in a priority queue, okay? That allows you to pick the cheapest edge out, right? Okay, but then what happens when you add the node? What operations do you need to know because I added the next node in? I have to find all the edges leaving the new guy, right? Yeah? See, when I add uh, one seven are already there in the tree, who is it that I'm going to add next? I'm going to add two to this set, right? Now I have to figure out who is leaving this component. Right? Well, all the edges, I have to look at all the edges leaving two because now they are also leaving the component, right? But what, can I include 20 in that? No, I should not include 20 in that, right? Why? Because that's, that's already part of the, this is not going to be leaving the component, right? So I can scan the edges out of two and delete, I won't, add this to the priority queue, but I, can, I have to add this to the priority queue, okay? Okay, so that one you can do, right? right? You know, but then you can check that, you know, if you use priority queue, that'll take log n. But that's actually quite complicated to keep track of which edges are already not leaving the component and stuff. There is another way of viewing Prim's algorithm. Instead of thinking about to which edge am I going to add, I think of which node should I add, right? So, for every node, we maintain the cheapest edge that is coming out from the current component, okay? So initially, all of them have infinity because they, there's no edge coming out of one to them. When we add one, we update for all its edges and guys, what is the cheapest edge that is incident to these guys, right? So seven says, aha, from one I have uh, an edge with length one, and this guy says 20, and six says 23. It's like Dijkstra's algorithm, every node maintains a number, which is what? From the current component, what is the cheapest edge that is incident on to me? Okay? Instead of maintaining edges leaving the component, we maintain numbers on the vertices. It's just an efficient implementation, okay? And then we pick the next guy to add to be the vertex with the smallest number on it, which is the same as finding the edge which is leaving the component with the smallest weight, okay? If we add that vertex, then we update all the nodes which are adjacent to it, which are not already in the character component. So Prim's algorithm works like Dijkstra's algorithm, except the meaning of the number that we store on the node is not the same as the distance from the source to that node, but simply the weight of the edge connecting the current component to that guy, okay? So that's, so effectively the running time of Prim's algorithm will be exactly the same as Dijkstra's algorithm. But the meaning of the operations is quite different, okay? All right, so, so uh, do you want me to run that on this, on this graph? Yeah, so initially we add one to the tree, right? And, uh, oh, sorry, uh, my pen is not working. So, uh, so everybody has infinity. We add one to the tree and we scan all the edges leaving uh, this one. And what happens to the number on seven? It becomes one because that's the cheapest edge incident to it because so far no edges have been incident to it. This guy has 20, this guy has six, uh, 23. Which one should we add next? Seven, right? Because it has the smallest number. So that becomes the tree. And then we update, look at all the edges leaving seven. What happens when we look at all the edges leaving seven? 
we update all the numbers on the these guys right how should we update this guy we will replace the 20 with 4 right it's only one edge length not the the length Dijkstra's algorithm would do 1 plus 4 right but no that's not what we're doing here we're only maintaining the the edge length of the last edge right so this guy's number will become 4 this guy's number will become well it'll stay 30 23 because this is not any cheaper this guy's number will become 9 this guy's number will become 16 this will be 25 and then the next guy to add will be this guy and then we scan this vertex to see what happens will the weight of this guy change no because it has 9 and it is 15 we are not going to change and and the next value to be added will be this and when we scan this guy what will happen to the the weight of this guy it it was 16 before it will become 3 now right and so it looks like Dijkstra's algorithm except that the meaning of the number on the node is not the distance to that from the source but simply the cheapest edge connecting that node from the current tree okay the meaning is different the operations are exactly the same the code looks very similar but the meaning is different okay and so you will get the same running time as uh, Dijkstra's algorithm though you know again I keep emphasizing that the meaning is different right but running time is very much similar to Dijkstra's algorithm you will get m plus n log n if you use decrease key operations okay and if you don't use decrease key operations and you do the same thing you know you will get uh, 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 m log n okay uh, okay 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 so it, it, it looks exactly like uh, Dijkstra's algorithm but the meaning is again different on what the weight of the on the node is so the running time will be m plus n log n okay so last algorithm Kruskal's algorithm how will you implement Kruskal's algorithm? First operation is to sort the edges, right? Yeah, because that's what you're doing, right? So then what do you do with Kruskal's algorithm? You try to add the current edge. When will you add the current edge? That if there's no cycle that you create, right? Okay, how will you detect cycles? Uh, you can do, yeah, you know, that's a little tricky, you know? If I want, to, I currently have a set of edges that I already added. When I want to add an edge, if I create a cycle, I am in trouble, right? Because there could be many connected components. What should I do? Yeah. Yeah. So Kruskal's algorithm is what motivated the disjoint sets data structure. In fact, it was the the algorithm motivated the design of the data structure, right? Many of you have seen disjoint sets data structure in 225. So Kruskal's algorithm can be implemented via disjoint sets data structure because the connected components are only becoming larger. Okay, the, the disjoint sets data structure is actually quite complicated and uh, difficult to, uh, to fully analyze in a, a class right now. But if you do it carefully, you will get m plus n log n time. Okay, uh, and if you do it, uh, you, I mean, if you analyze it very carefully you will get many more interesting things but I want to finish up by showing you what people have played around with, with minimum spanning trees right you know it's a, it's a it's a problem that obsesses the theory people because it's so simple and so many algorithms work so the holy grail here is is there an algorithm which will run in linear time okay that means not m log n but m because finding a spanning tree is just m time right is search so can we get the minimum spanning tree in M time? And people have killed themselves over this, right? So the, the long ago, 1987, right? You can get M log star M. Okay, what is log star M? The number of logs you need to take to get a con basically two. Okay. Log star M is the number of logs you need to take before the number becomes a constant it's really tiny okay it's 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 almost for practical purposes log star m is constant right all right but it is not theoretically still linear okay okay so that is uh, that is uh, there's a randomized algorithm which takes a m plus n time and the current best algorithm is m plus n times alpha mn which is the no it's not alpha mn it's the inverse ackerman function alpha inverse of mn i don't know if you have heard of the ackerman function 
Ackerman function grows extremely fast. It, it is uh, the, one of the fastest, growing, I mean, the, the fastest growing function that we can simply define, okay? So the inverse of that doesn't grow at all, basically, more or less, right? It does grow, but, you know, alpha mn for mn is 10 to the 10 is still only 4, okay? But it's still not fixed constant, okay? So, so it's kind of interesting that why, why do we get this running time in, in an algorithm? This bizarro function is, uh, is in an algorithm for a spanning tree problem, right? So it's, you know, if you want to learn about this, you know, you, you have to do more math, right? Uh, but that's the fastest deterministic algorithm known for find computing a minimum spanning tree. But this question is still open. Is there a deterministic linear time algorithm for MST? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, you know, this is uh, fun stuff, but, uh, but just to tell you that, uh, that people spend a lot of time on simple problems. So this is the fastest. Oh, this, no, the, this is a bit operation. Okay, so yeah, that's a little tricky, right? You know, you're all fiddling with bits and stuff. M plus N, yeah, but you know, this, this is a model of computation is not, uh, not nice. I'm allowing you to look at bits and fiddle with the bits and stuff. So it's not the standard operation. So it's a little tricky. It, it is M plus N, but again, as I said, this is not standard operation. Three is randomized, expected time. It's not deterministic algorithm. On the average, it'll take M plus N time, but it can take longer in, in the worst case. And this is a deterministic time, okay? Since we didn't talk about randomized algorithms, I didn't want to claim this is the fastest. But this, this, this is the expected time-wise, it's the fastest, okay? All right, that's it for today. Uh, good luck with the exam and uh, see you next. I, I won't be here next week, but uh, uh, there is no lecture on Tuesday. Uh, Lenny will be giving a lecture on Thursday and it's a very important lecture because it's on, we are changing topics from algorithms to intractability. So it's an important lecture, at least from a finals point of view. And it's a, it's a fun lecture too.